welcome you all to our meeting today. I hope everybody's gotten outside at least a little bit to enjoy the sunshine. So I made a run, run to all the clubs this morning and um, it was nice to have the, the fresh air and getting to see um, the kids and, and, um, and our staff at, at work um, and to be in the sunshine. So let's kick it off with our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So Anne, I'm gonna hand it off to you uh, for invocation and your words of inspiration for us all today. Oh. You're muted. I got it. How's that? That's okay. great. Thanks. Got it. Um, nowadays, I am walking about two miles every day, um, usually just here from my house out in the country. And so I've been able to be watching spring come, and it's been really, really wonderful, particularly after this tough year. And I was thinking about spring, and I was also thinking about our, our uh, speaker today and about independence rising from some tough times into much more positive times. And I thought of the lyrics of a song that I think a lot of you in my age group will remember. It was done by Cat Stevens, but it actually goes back to a hymn, a much older hymn. And I think it's appropriate for our topic today and this time of year. Morning has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. Praise for the singing, praise for the morning, praise for them springing fresh from the world. Sweet the rain's new fall, sunlit from heaven, like the first dewfall on the first grass. Praise for the sweetness of a wet garden, sprung in completeness where his feet pass. Mine is the sunlight, mine is the morning, born of the one light Eden saw play. Praise with elation, praise every morning, God's recreation of the new day. Morning has broken like the first morning, Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. Praise for the singing, praise for the morning, praise for them springing fresh from the world. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, that's lovely. And I think we all, yeah, this time of year is just so beautiful and I feel very fortunate um, to live in the valley, regardless of grass allergies. <laughs> All righty, um, I'm not seeing, um, oh, Allison, Kelly, please introduce your guest. Yes, thank you, President Sue and fellow Rotarians. I, it is my honor today to introduce again, Jonathan Partridge, the Director of Community Engagement Development at Liberty House. Uh, one of the last couple of times he is scheduled for his induction next week. Great, good to see you, Jonathan. And then, um, Mark, do you want to uh, introduce Elena for the last time as a guest? Absolutely. Uh, President Sue, fellow Rotarians, please welcome Elena Harvey. Uh, today will be her induction into the club. That's great. Hi, Elena. Hello. You'll be the superstar here in about four minutes. So, um, all right. Um, I'm just checking. It doesn't look like we have any more guests or visiting Rotarians. So Russ McCracken, past president Russ, I'm gonna hand it off to you for your announcement. Thanks, President Sue. Um, uh, fellow club members, my apologies for having to postpone that last uh, amphitheater huddle, but when they're pouring concrete, we just don't wanna be around. So uh, we, we have moved it and it will be this Friday, day after tomorrow, uh, again at noon, just an opportunity for all of us to get underneath the new roof to um, uh, get a better feel for what the stage is going to look like. Uh, the forms are in place now for the, uh, the front of the stage. And we all will have an opportunity to stand and look at the, um, uh, at least half of the 15 foot stainless steel rotary wheel that's been embedded into, the con into a concrete wall there. So just as a heads up, Dawkey will be pouring that front wall right after we leave. So uh, we're gonna have to keep ourselves to our noon to one time frame. So look forward to seeing you there then. 
Great. Right. Thanks, Russ. I'm excited to go back over and check it out. Uh, all right, Dale Penn, bell ringers. All right, thank you very much. So I've only got a couple bell ringers and I've got one from the floor. So if you have any, uh, please let me know as soon as possible. And I'm gonna include in the chat link one more time, the link for everyone to pay for bell ringers. So the first bell ringer is from Linda, Be Linda Bednards. Uh, Linda uh, may not be here, Warren may be here for uh, standing in for her. Uh, she's ringing the bell for the amazing Salem race, Salem for Refu Refugee Edition, to be held this Saturday, May 15th. Linda is participating in this fundraiser as part of the Wellness First Team. She's been part of a wellness slash mental health committee helping to develop support resources for refugees who have been supported by the Salem for Refugee program in the last few years. SFR has done an amazing job of supporting refugee families from around the world, including Syria, the Republic of Congo, Sudan, and others. If any fellow Rotarians would like to support Salem for Refugees by sponsoring Linda's wellness team, please contact her, and I will include her contact information in the chat. Please ring the bell for the amazing race for Salem for Refugees. Ron Kellerman, I'd like to please ring the bell and I'm going to share my screen just for a short second here. So Ron would like to ring the bell to celebrate seeing his first grandchild, 13 month old Hazel in the United Kingdom. It took a few days for her to warm up to, uh, to them, but it was well worth the five COVID tests, five day quarantine, and the logistics of navigating the UK's strict COVID measures. She's a keeper, but Kathy and Ron don't recall how much work a toddler could be. Please ring the bell. All right, and then uh, from the floor, I have a one. So Allison, you're up. Yeah, thank you, Dale, and President Sue again, fellow Rotarians. Just on behalf of Liberty House, thank you to all of you who participated in our mega raffle. We held that live stream drawing last week. It was very successful. Hats off to Jonathan, who worked really hard and led a team through something really new and innovative. All of the funds we were able to raise supports the programs. Um, and if any of you would like further information about Liberty House's programs and what we do and how we help our community, we are happy to provide that. And there are continuing opportunities um, this spring to help uh, match your donation um, will be matched um, up to until we reach a total of $50,000. So we're really happy to offer that and let us know if you want more information. But mostly thanks for supporting children. It was an excellent event, Allison, Jonathan. It was really well done. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. You bet. Except for bell ringers, unless anyone else has some on the floor. Okay. All righty. Seeing none. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, everybody, for your bell ringers. All right. Mark Hunter and Elena Harvey. It's time for our newest member to be introduced. So I'm going to hand it off to you, Mark, to start us off. All right. Thank you, President Sue. So um, I have the pleasure of introducing to you in a little more detail, Elena Harvey. Uh, Elena was uh, born and raised in the Portland metro area uh, before moving to Salem. What brought her to Salem uh, initially was to uh, finish a degree in business at Corbin University, which she has graduated from there in 2015. Uh, from there, she went to work for Multnomah University as social media PR specialist and then taking a position here locally at Spire Management, uh, where she supported nonprofit trade associations. Uh, Elena is a young professional. She's particularly invested in opportunities for personal growth and challenge in her relatively new position as PR and marketing lead at Union Gospel Mission. Yay. Uh, work <laughs> takes on a new meaning when helping to change the face of homelessness in our community. Hmm, there is a PR theme right there. Uh, continually, she's reevaluating and challenging the definition of the good life, daily looking to God to help define that for her. And while she loves to embrace the quirks that make her stand out from the crowd, um, and I can speak to those, she can't <laughs> deny that she loves to hike and escape the great indoors like um, most everybody else who lives in the Pacific Northwest. 
She's highly motivated to by a desire to serve and sacrifice, learn, build friendships, and collaborate with leaders in the Salem area to positively impact our corner of the world and beyond. She is grateful for this opportunity to, to join us. And I will add that she has hit the ground running at Union Gospel Mission as in, is an incredible new leader for our staff. And I expect nothing less as a member of the Rotary Club of Salem. Please welcome Elena Harvey to the club. Wonderful, thank you for that, Mark. Um, so induction time, Elena, official right now, okay. So uh, thank you again, Mark, for introducing Elena Harvey into membership in our club. Recognizing folks that will continue to build this great club and bringing them on board is very important to our club's livelihood. To show our appreciation, Mark, the club will award you with 250 Paul Harris points towards your next fellowship. So Elena, through your membership in Rotary, you can build lifelong friendships and join forces with like-minded people around the world who desire to make a difference in their communities. Our club is made up of leaders and potential leaders who are inspired by our motto, service above self. As Rotarians, we have all pledged to uphold the highest ethical standards, subscribe to the object of Rotary, and live by the four-way test. Regular attendance, whatever it might look like, at our weekly <laughs> meetings is an important part of our membership, your membership, but Rotary is much more than just a lunch club, as we've learned over the last 14 months. As you come more involved in our club, you will begin to understand the power of Rotary through expanded friendships and involvement in your choice of the many committees that we offer. As you build those friendships and contribute to our impact here and around the world, you will truly understand what it means to be a member of this club and, and one of 1.2 million Rotarians worldwide. We are a vibrant action-oriented club and as such, we expect you to roll up your sleeves and get involved. Therefore, Elena, as our newest member of our club, do you pledge to uphold the four-way test, to serve on at least two committees and to contribute to the club in every way you can? I do. Wonderful. And fellow Rotarians, do you pledge to warmly welcome Elena into our club and to offer her your full support in all that we do? I do. Yeah. <laughs> that was a thumbs up from everybody, <laughs> Elena. Thumbs up. Um, so uh, fellow Rotarians, please welcome Elena Harvey as the world's newest Rotarian. Wonderfully happy here, Elena. Do, do you want to add anything to what Mark shared about you? Well, thank you so much for welcoming me in with open arms. And um, I think, you know, pretty much what Mark read sums it up well. Um, uh, it just so happens that I truly believe that um, I'm here to serve on this earth and not be served. So that jives pretty well with my personal mission. And um, I'm looking forward to getting to know you all much better. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. It's wonderful to have you here. Okay, uh, so Russ McCracken, as program chair, I wanna hand the meeting off to you now. Okay, thank you, President Sue, and hello again, everybody. Um, <clears throat> as a resident of the south side of Salem, my trips to the coast take me across the Independence Bridge. Over the course of my 14 years living in this great area, I've had the opportunity to watch the tremendous growth in our neighbor to the west, the city of Independence. Add to that the bird's eye view in the last couple of years using their airport for landing practice has made this community one of my favorites in the area. Today, we're gonna to hear a story about how Independence has embarked on their journal, a journey of building a strong economy and creating a great place to live. But first, our virtual head table. Jen Columbus and her husband, Alex, are residents of Independence. Our program today would not have been, uh, would not have been possible were it not for their involvement, contacts, and active touch within the community. Thank you, Jen. Along with Jen and Alex, we also have joining us John McCulley. Technically, John and his wife, Julie, live in Monmouth, but I think he could throw a rock from his front yard into Independence, so that's close enough for me. Welcome, John. <laughs> Thank you. Our speaker today, Sean Irvine, has worked for the City of Independence for over 15 years, filling a variety of community and economic development roles. In that time, Sean has led successful business recruitment efforts and worked with regional partners to support new businesses and help existing ones grow. He was a longtime board member of the Independence Downtown Association and has worked extensively as the, the liaison between the organization and the city. Together, they have accomplished a wide variety of infrastructure and beautification projects downtown, filling storefronts, 
in helping revive, uh, revive Independence Historic Downtown. In addition to his role as a primary con uh, point of contact for business looking to grow or locate in Independence, Sean led the city's Vision 2020 and Vision 2040 action plan projects and has coordinated several workforce development and entrepreneurship programs for the city. Sean is also the staff person for the city's Park and Recreation Committee, I mean Commission. Prior to his time in Independence, Sean spent four years as a Municipal Services Development Specialist with the Peace Corps, implementing transparency and citizen involvement projects in Paraguay, South America. And Sean, just, you know, we have several Peace Corps members, uh, former Peace Corps members in our club, so they were probably pretty happy to hear that. But without anything else, I'm going to go ahead and turn the uh, program over to you, Sean, your ball. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm really uh, happy to be here. Appreciate the introduction. Um, yeah, it's always kind of fun. Um, especially on the Peace Corps side, you never know where you're going to bump into a uh, fellow, fellow volunteers and it, uh, you know, share some, some good stories. Can everybody see my uh, slide deck decently here? I think I'm going to assume yes. Okay. I think I see a couple nods there. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and chat with you today. Um, yeah, I've been in independence, um, as Russ said, about uh, a little over 15 years. Um, what you see today is the result of, I mean, literally over 20 years worth of worth of effort on behalf of a whole lot of people. So uh, you're probably going to hear me say I uh, a fair bit. And really, when I say I, I mean we. Um, and I will probably say we a lot as well. Um, the and what I'm going to try to do is give you a little bit of kind of our our guiding philosophy, talk a little about where we kind of where we were and how we kind of got to where we are today, and then talk a little bit about where we're going to be going. Um, so with that, I'm an economic development guy. I'm the economic development director for the city. Um, and traditional economic tends to focus on really kind of a couple of key areas that you see here, recruitment, business retention, expansion, and community development. And we do that as well. But, you know, in Independence, being a small town, we've really tried to rethink how to be more effective. And we've taken a different approach. Um, we like to call it being a smart rural community. Um, before you'll recall, before kind of tech took over the smart term, um, there was uh, smart growth and smart, uh, you know, kind of smart living were, were, were watch words and we kind of believe in that. Um, we take a holistic perspective of economic development. Uh, we believe live, livability and quality of life matters. We, we have an opportunity with a large regional workforce. Um, we believe that a proud, engaged, empowered citizenry uh, is critical to uh, quality of life and uh, economic and community development, um, equitable economic and social outcomes, um, ec uh, accessible and efficient government. Um, and, uh, you know, really kind of foremost for us is, is this idea of a revitalized downtown and waterfront to be kind of the hub of the community. Um, and then in Independence, we're also fortunate that we've, um, we built out our own gigabit fiber uh, broadband network back in the uh, mid 2000s. So we've had it for quite a while. Um, and that is a, a huge asset that, um, that we think is a, it plays a big role in our economic development. You know, we also say that, that we as a city have a very entrepreneurial mindset. Um, you know, we are, we embrace change. Uh, we believe anything is possible. We're willing to take risks. Uh, and we believe innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. When, uh, you know, it, it's, we embrace collaborative opportunities. We don't have enough capacity ourselves to do everything or at least everything that we want to do. Um, and so we really embrace, you know, partnerships, both public and private. Um, but it's all about the big picture, getting everyone and everything aligned and moving in the same general direction. You know, our entire community is led by the values of being open, approachable, grounded, and collaborative. Uh, you know, we far, you know, we firmly believe farmers, workers, business leaders, outside organizations, internal organizations, we all work together to promote growth and independence. Um, you know, we're leveraging our fiber capacity uh, to connect people to training, jobs, education, uh, and more, because it's about, you know, equitable access to, to opportunities. We want everybody to have the same chance uh, to succeed in life uh, when, you know, if, you're, if you're living in independence. And really, you know, kind of getting back to the beginning of this story, um, this all starts with a vision. It starts with engagement. Uh, we create alignment and engagement by putting the community at the center of the conversation. You know, we get everyone involved in these big community-wide vision and action plans. Um, you know, by getting everybody involved, those common ideas, it's, it's, it, I mean, we, we were crowdsourcing before crowdsourcing was cool. Uh, because, you know, you get enough people involved in those good ideas kind of bubble to the surface and the so-so the ones kind of sink to the 
bottom. Um, and that vision be then becomes the North Star. Everything we do happens with that goal in mind. And for us, it's about revitalizing the downtown. You know, back in 1996, the community really felt like things were going the wrong way. We took a year, um, and again, we I say we, I was not there, um, but we took a year uh, engaging the community, holding ice cream socials, doing surveys, and just asking people, well, you know, if independence became what you want it to be, what would it look like? And what do we need to do to get there? Um, and the answer inevitably came down to small towns live and die with their downtowns. You know, if, if the downtown becomes this vibrant hub of the community, the rest of independence will also succeed. Uh, and so that really became the vision that has guided everything we've done since. That original 1996 plan, there's a lot of actions in there that came from the community um, that have sort of turned into a reality today that you see in independence today. We knocked off enough of those projects that we did a new plan of the Vision 2020 uh, in 2008. We got over a thousand people involved in that process. And again, we knocked off enough of those projects that, it, that we just recently, um, this last spring, completed the Vision 2040 process. In that case, we got over 2,000 people involved. I mean, this is in a community of under 10,000 people. So we're getting a significant portion of our population involved in these processes to, to set that vision, to reaffirm that vision, you know, identify projects and things to do. And then the city just kind of makes it happen. You know, the, the worst thing we can do is be, you know, kind of sitting in our ivory tower offices saying, well, we know what to do. You guys don't worry about that. We're going to tell you what needs to happen. So having a plan isn't enough. Um, you know, you also have to try to try something. You have to be willing to take a chance. You know, independence, we are, I think, pretty well known, uh, at least amongst the sort of the city government world, um, as being risk takers. You know, we mitigate as best we can, but then we try stuff. Uh, we start small and we try and we leverage our success. Um, and I already, I, I was wondering what, how long it was going to take before I got asked about this, but I already got asked about independence station. Um, you know, sometimes you fail and you got to just learn from that and move on. Um, independence station, if you're not familiar with it, you probably are familiar with the giant concrete skeleton that sits uh, just off Main Street. Street, um, in downtown Independence. Uh, it was started in 2004 as the highest rated Leeds Platinum building in the world. Uh, it was going to be a mixed use development. The city actually uh, acquired the property and sold it to the guy who did that development. Um, there's a long, I guess, literally spend an hour going over the whole story, but um, the guy essentially ran through too much, you know, all of his money, uh, got a loan guaranteed by a big company, ran through enough of that, lawsuits, lawsuits, lawsuits. Um, it's traded hands several times since then. Um, but on a positive note, the most recent um, uh, owner uh, is talking, you know, is currently talking to tenants, um, has developed plans. We actually just a couple of weeks ago had a pre-development, pre-application meeting with him. So he's actually getting ready to come in and submit for permits uh, for that building to complete the building as a mixed use kind of ground floor, residential upper floor commercial development. Um, I have learned over many, many, many years uh, to not take anything for granted for that project. So I'm going to knock on wood and uh, and say no more because I don't want to jinx anything. <laughs> um, so anyways, I want to kind of take you, take you back. Uh, this is a picture from 2000 in downtown Independence. Um, I wish I had time to go through all of the before and after pictures we have because they're really impressive and illustrative of everything that has changed. But, you know, like that, that plan that happened in 1996 because the community really felt like things were going in the wrong direction and they didn't want to be a just a bedroom community. They wanted to be a vibrant, full service community. Um, and so for the city, we said, well, okay, what can we do to, you know, we know the goal is to make downtown vibrant. You know, to do that, we have to bring people downtown. We're a city. What can we do to bring people downtown? So, okay, cities do infrastructure. Well, you know, one of the projects on the downtown development plan was a streetscape rehab with the bump outs and the wide sidewalks and the street lights and everything, you know, that's kind of common now, but back in 2000, we were, we were early adopters of that, um, of this idea, but it creates a really good pedestrian environment. And then I talked about leverage, you know, we didn't just build it. We, we worked it, you know, we, we, um, we had low, you know, so our banners, a lot of folks have banners on the streetlights. Ours are hand painted by local artists. You know, those are unique pieces of art, each and every one of them that adds a special character to our community. You know, we work with our downtown association to have fun events and activities like the Airstream Rally on Main where we park you know, where we park Airstreams on, on Main Street and, and they, they, they have tours. Um, you know, and because 
you know, you talk about risks. We tore up Main Street for an entire summer to do this. Uh, and because we engaged the community, this was a community project, not the city saying this is a great idea. Um, you know, people got excited and jumped in and contributed as opposed to screaming at us. You know, one of the other big projects was this big bowl that was in the middle of our downtown. Um, you know, everybody said this would be a great spot for an amphitheater. Um, it's also probably never going to happen because it's way too big of a project for us to do. Um, as you know, as has been shown over and over again, an independence no project is too big. Um, it took us three years. We used a lot of grants. We actually worked to deal with the National Guard. They they did all the rough grading for us as a training exercise, but we did it. We accomplished it, um, and that's goes a long way towards getting more excitement and involvement from the community because they see their ideas, you know, becoming real. And then again, we didn't just build it; we activated it. We we started a summer concert and movie series um, to bring people to. To the community and it's been great because it's both a community project a community event you know as neighbors getting together and having fun but it's also supporting the downtown businesses bringing customers downtown and it's a for me it's a recruitment tool you know i there's a bunch of businesses and business owners that come through independence and are like yeah man i come to every summer concert it's awesome i love independence and i want to put my business there so it's a it's a recruitment tool as well so the uh the whole idea was if we can bring people downtown, the businesses or business people will see this and say, gee, there's a whole big customer base. I should open a business to tap into that customer base. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, I mean, the short, the short version is with a lot of work, it's, it's been working. You know, folks are reinvesting in the downtown buildings. We are big believers in historic preservation. We have a facade improvement grant program to bring those storefronts back to their historic look. Um, but we also partnered with uh, folks to do uh, micro enterprise development classes to support entrepreneurship because those businesses that go in there need to have those foundations that that support to succeed. And we actually, a bunch of the businesses that are in our downtown shops um, are graduates of our entrepreneurship programs. Um, you know, and again, I'm talking about um, the, you know, being an economic development guy, most of us tend to focus on industrial recruitment and I do too, but, you know, Every city says they're business friendly. And when I get a site selector coming to town, I don't have to give them a pitch. I take them downtown for a cup of coffee or a beer and they just kind of look around and be like, yeah, you guys get this. You guys understand what it means to support business, to be a business friendly community. I can see that. You don't even need to say anything. Um, so it's a, it's a huge advantage for us. So the city made a lot of strategic investments over the years. And again, I wish I could spend the time to talk through all of them because they, they all were important in their own ways. Um, you know, a lot of them were public-private partnerships. You know, we built the movie theater that's just off of Main Street downtown as a public-private partnership. We, we built a new library downtown, which actually brings almost as many people to the downtown as the movie theater, which is pretty amazing. We redeveloped the old city hall. Um, the downtown is in the middle of two and a half miles of frontage on the Willamette River that the city owns. So we've been working to turn that into a, uh, you know, a, a greenway with all kinds of recreational infrastructure with the, the, you know, the, the amphitheater, with the trail system, with a fenced dog park, with soccer fields. We're trying to pivot the downtown and the community back towards the river. Um, and, you know, again, bringing people downtown. If we've got this great recreational environment, it will bring people downtown who will then also go to the shops. But this property here, the Valley Concrete site, as far back as the 1996 plan, the community said, wouldn't that be a cool redevelopment opportunity? It's li literally been a gravel, mine and a, con a gravel mine and a concrete batch plant for over 100 years, but it is you know, prime location in the middle of downtown, you know, what if it was redeveloped with a mix of commercial and residential and, and recreational uses, that would just be a game changer for our community. And of course, you know, yeah, that'd be great. It's never going to happen. Um, but we put it in the plan. And then in 2008 with the Vision 2020, you know, it, we said, hey, is this still a good idea? And I was like, that would be such a cool thing if it happened, you know, never going to happen. But lo and behold, 2014 rolls around, the, the concrete company is relocating um, outside of town. So now there's an opportunity. Um, you know, this, this idea that has been around in the community, in the, in the community's plans for literally 15, 17 years, now there's an, an opportunity to make it happen. And it's kind of one of those like, you gotta do it or you're gonna miss the chance. So 
you know, we were fortunate that our city council was willing to take a risk and said, you know, this has literally been a community priority for 15 plus years. It's now or never. Let's see if we can make something happen here. Um, and it's again, this is one is I could spend a long time talking just about this project, but the city invested about six million dollars in acquiring and preparing the site, building the infrastructure and, and some incentives for for the for the development. That's a lot of money for a city like Independence. But um, again, we had the, the confidence of knowing that our community supported this, this idea, this project. We offset some of it with grants. And then, you know, we actually hired an outside economist to do a return on investment analysis for us. Um, and he came back and said, this thing pays for itself in eight years, which is a, I mean, which is a great, great, um, re you know, return on investment for a public-private partnership like this. And then when you factor in, you've got, we, we've built a 75 room uh, independent boutique hotel, and then there's there's 124 apartment and townhome units going in on this property. That is going to create about six million dollars in new spending annually just in independence, you know, and largely in the downtown. Not to mention the jobs at the hotel, the you know, the construction jobs during construction, and then of course all the spin-off jobs from the from the businesses that are that are enjoying that additional spending. The benefits of this project are just really, you know, kind of amazing. Um, and we're seeing that already. The The hotel has been finished, um, opened in October 2019, which of course was a not particularly auspicious time to do it, but they're actually, um, you know, really doing well now. The apartments are actually, they've just started moving people in. Um, and we have already been seeing spinoff benefits in terms of new businesses opening downtown, people uh, renovating buildings. Um, and uh, and then you can actually see in this picture, kind of in the, in the, the back right there, there's a the wood structure that's going up, that's another mixed use building, um, ground floor commercial, upper floor residential that is is happening because of all this development, uh, but it's from a different developer. So it's it's really kind of taking our, our downtown and the, the, the local economy up to a whole new level. So, you know, we really pride ourselves on our community engagement, our collaboration, creativity and building an ecosystem uh, for economic development. And what that does is it creates resiliency. And we have really, I think, seen that with COVID um, in, the, in the last year. Um, you know, early on in COVID, we focused on essentially lifting the community spirits and telling people to shop local. We did a Mother's Day gift guide. We we had ran a social media promotion called Takeout Indie, where uh, if you uh, ate uh, at one of the the local restaurants, or if you if you took out food from a local restaurant and put it on Facebook with the with the hashtag Takeout Indie, you'd get entered in a weekly drawing for a gift card. Um, and then again, you know, just kind of trying to have fun with it. We we actually. Um, coincidentally had a Elsa and Olaf costume from, from a different event. And we just put people in those costumes and drove them around town in the back of a flatbed trailer blasting frozen music, uh, you know, once a week. And it was just this great kind of like people would come out, the kids would come running out. And it was just, it was a, it was a blast. I thought it was going to be, I thought people were going to enjoy it, but they enjoyed it way more than I expected. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, we're always thinking, you know, what's our focus? We're about supporting local businesses. How do we support our local businesses, especially in this, this critical time? Um, and leveraging what we have. So what do we have? We've got a great plaza that's right on Main Street downtown. Let's turn it into an outdoor dining environment, you know, since people can't eat inside the restaurants. We've got soccer fields at the Independent Sports Park. Let's have drive-in movies at the, at the sports park because we've got tons of time there. And, but again, it's about leverage. So we're having these movies. How can we make these movies support our businesses? So we've created an ad reel before the movies that, that you know, essentially we made ads for all of our local businesses to promote those local businesses. And if you came to the drive-in and had and brought food or a receipt from that day from a local business, you got entered into a, uh, into a drawing for a free night at the, at the Independence Hotel in downtown Independence. So just, again, trying to just those small ways get people thinking about supporting those local, those local businesses. So in the fall, we had a pumpkin patch in Riverview Park, you know, socially distanced pumpkin patch in the, in, in the park to try to get people downtown. Um, you know, again, bring, how do we get people downtown and encourage them to then go into, go shop at the stores? So we created what we called Indie Bucks and put five Indie Bucks on the bottom of each pumpkin. And that was good, good as cash in any of the downtown businesses. So people, many of them took those to the ice cream shop, to the, to the bakery, to the coffee shop and, you know, and spent it and then some at that, um, 
at that place. We liked the idea so much, uh, we ended up creating our own scratchets. Uh, so this first happened uh, right, you know, before Christmas, where if you went to any of the seven participating businesses and bought something, you got a scratch it. Every scratch it was a winner uh, from a dollar up to up to twenty five dollars, and it was good as cash at any of those locations on a subsequent purchase. Uh, you know, so again, encourage people to come back and spend more money. Um, that was hugely popular, and so we used CARES money to to do it again in February with fourteen businesses participating, and then again in uh, in April uh, with uh, twenty two businesses participating, and people just just loved it. It was such a such a unique treat, and um, and we you know through our we were able to track the the the, the ticket the kind of the, the total amount that was spent um, pretty well and it looks like the um, each dollar that of of scratch it winnings leveraged an additional five dollars of spending at that at that place so it really kind of did what it was supposed to do um, and then of course, you know, a lot of cities did grants, we did grants as well, um, but we also did technical assistance because we're always trying to listen to our community. And we, we, we talked to the businesses, listen to them, say, what do you need? And they kept saying, you know, we don't need classes. I don't wanna spend a week in a class to learn how to do something. I wanna sit down with somebody who knows how to do it and have them help me do it. So we essentially ran a technical assistance program, getting people connected to one-on-one -on -one consulting to help them uh, pivot online and complete some type of an achievable project Project that would help their business. And, they, and it was great because we helped 30 local businesses um, that helped them meet an immediate need that also then set them up in the long term in terms of better social media presence, in terms of a website, in terms of an online ordering system. Um, it was a really, really effective program that we're going to continue to, uh, to roll out there. Oops, I'm not quite ready for that yet. Um, and so I think just to wrap the, the COVID piece, you know, I think we have seen the, the benefits of our long term work in this area because there's a lot of people, you know, still come, you know, coming downtown. The, you know, we had a couple businesses that, that closed early in COVID. We've had three new restaurants open uh, in downtown Independence since COVID happened. We've got a new Thai restaurant. Um, the brewery uh, opened their tap room uh, and then Gilgamesh opened the river, which is a, a pub and eventually will be a distillery. Uh, and it's gonna be an outdoor music venue as well. Um, so I think that's a really positive sign. We also have um, actually a new restaurant group that's planning to open five uh, restaurants in downtown, in downtown independence um, that's going to be you know, hugely important as well um, we're bringing back the summer series we had to cancel it last year but this year we're kind of taking a a baby step in with some you know kind of smaller bands six six uh, events uh, in july and august um, in july 4th we're having two nights of fireworks uh, you know we're working we're gonna have to limit crowd sizes and do some things there but we are constantly looking forward moving forward and trying to make sure that we're continuing to um, to make good things happen for our community and for our, our, our local businesses. So I mentioned um, our fiber internet system, and this is another one I could spend a long time talking about, but being a small town, we can move quickly and having gigabit fiber internet means we can do a lot of things that other communities can't. Um, in terms of entrepreneurship and tech startups, there's a lot of interest and opportunity with agriculture, but most of the companies are in the city. So we have essentially set ourselves up as an interface between urban technology and rural agriculture. You know, what are the problems that agriculture has? Let's see if we can find tech companies that can develop solutions, create jobs locally, you know, deploying and developing these solutions, but also that make agriculture more competitive, more profitable, so we can get a double benefit off of that. This work is going really well, we've actually kind of passed the baton on to SEDCOR, which is the Regional Economic Development Organization. Um, and they've formalized it under the name of the Northwest Ag Innovation Hub. Uh, and again, if you're interested, there's a lot more I can talk about that, but it's, uh, um, I will take too long doing it. <laughs> um, but, you know, kind of, you know, as a related to that, we are working on building an entrepreneurial ecosystem. We are getting people engaged and connected to resources who want to start businesses or grow businesses. Our goal is to have this kind of unified system of events, activities, mentors, experts, um, and programs so that people can kind of 
you know, you know, if you've got an idea or you've got a business, you can kind of plug into any one of these different areas and get connected to the right people, the right resources to help your business grow. Um, we've been running meetups. We've run a startup weekend. Uh, we run an annual event we call Fail Fest. You know, I mentioned that, you know, you got to learn, be able to learn from failure. So we actually celebrate failure and have an event in February uh, where we get successful entrepreneurs uh, to get up in front of everybody and tell their stories of failure. Because I think everybody tends to kind of idolize entrepreneurs entrepreneurs as these amazing successful people uh, who never screw up. And it's like, no, no, no. The reality is you go out and you screw up and you learn from it. And then you do it again and you screw up and you learn from it. Uh, and, you know, and eventually you succeed. And so we want everybody to be able to understand that, recognize that failure is not the, the end all be all, uh, and hopefully learn from other people's failures. Cause you know, the worst thing you can do is make the same mistake twice. Uh, then that actually is a failure. Um, but again, you know, public private partnerships, uh, we were fortunate. Kate Schwarzler opened Indie Commons, a co-working space in downtown Independence. We've been doing a lot of work with her um, really to kind of position that co-working space as almost like an incubator where like, you know, the home for these meetups and these activities and these programs. Um, and, and we've also spun off uh, a separate nonprofit organization called Indie Idea Hub um, that is totally focused on microenterprise development and programming. The uh, and the other, this is the most recent um, uh, news and success that we've got. We've just opened a shared use commercial kitchen at Indie Commons. So this is a licensed commercial kitchen um, with all the equipment um, that a food entrepreneur can rent for an hour or for a day uh, to, you know, try out new recipes, uh, you know, create a new product, uh, spin up a new company, run pop-up restaurant uh, days, uh, you know, kind of whatever whatever you want to do with food, you can do it at this kitchen. Um, it's, a, again, public-private partnership, you know, leverages a, a USDA grant that the city was able to get. Um, we're working with Indie Idea Hub to run entrepreneurship programming, targeting, targeting um, you know, food entrepreneurs. Um, and there's even a, uh, a, Indie Commons has a great event space, which we will be able to use as pop-up, you know, restaurants, tastings, you know, activities like that. And then we're, we're adding a, we're calling it a micro retail storefront because it's not going to be a full-blown retail shop, but there's going to be several shelves with kind of made in Polk County products. And the idea is, you know, another opportunity for local business people who, who, who are creating products to have an outlet to sell them. But also if you're an entrepreneur and you come use the kitchen for a new food product, here is an immediate place opportunity for you to test your market, you know, put it out there, see, see, see what sells, you know, try different packaging styles, you know, try out different things and get immediate feedback from retail customers. So it's just another way to kind of support those, um, those entrepreneurs um, and people who are trying to, to, to spin up new businesses. Um, because, you know, the other thing is, you know, a lot of economic development people like, I mean, you, you, you want to, you, you love the big win, you know, scoring a big business with a hundred jobs or whatever, but, you know, if we can help entrepreneur, you know, 10 entre entrepreneurs spin up new businesses, five of them hire two people each, you know, we're talking, you know, 15, 20 jobs. That's a significant thing for a place like Independence. So, and, it, and it's also, it's diversified, it's more resilient. Um, and frankly, it adds a lot more character to the community when you think about all of these individual businesses. So that's how, you know, I could talk all day about, you know, what we do and what we've achieved. Um, uh, suffice to say, we're a creative city that, that knows how to get things done. We like making things happen. We're highly focused on growing our economy and our community, but it's always within that context of, you know, keeping independence as this great small town, you know, no matter how big we grow, if we've got this vibrant downtown as part of a great walkable community, it's always going to, and we retain that kind of that neighborly helping each other out, getting engaged, you, you, you know, the person sitting next to you at the bar kind of thing, then we're always going to, you know, no matter how big we get, we're going to have that, that great small town feel. Um, so I think I saw a few things popping in the chat. Um, I'm always happy to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, so feel free to, to reach out anytime. Um, and I have not been watching the chat, so I don't know if there's any questions so, <laughs> or not. <laughs> right now, right now, there's a comment. This is Sue, Sean. Um, right now, there's a comment, highly complimentary comment, but um, but folks can start asking questions. Um, this blows my mind, to be honest. Uh, I haven't gotten out for a while, and, and clearly I'm missing the boat of going over to Independence and really enjoying and embracing everything that you've done. This is incredible. Incredible. 
So are there questions from the membership or maybe comments from folks that live in independence? Oh, Ron yes. Kellerman, you have a question. Well, first of all, Sean, uh, I'd like to say when we organized the very first Airstream on Main Street rally on the West Coast in 2017, and it had only been done once before on the East Coast or in the Midwest somewhere, we didn't know what we were doing. You guys didn't know what you're doing, but you were so supportive and willing to try everything. And uh, it was just a really fun experience and all that. So thank you so much. Uh, you really walked the talk just as much as you're talking the talk today. So thank you very much. And next presentation, you ought to talk about the Rogue Farm down south, which is a big bicycle and motorcycle destination. Yeah, unfortunately, they actually have closed. They they oh. they, cl they closed this this year. Um, yeah, I'm I'm hopeful something else similar will go in there. But yeah, that was a that was a, a bit of a blow to our our tourism <laughs> tourism efforts. All right, um, Jane, you had a comment for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sean. great presentation, Sean. It was, the, I love your town. And I think um, my comments, it's not a question, my comment and compliment is that Independence did what Salem has so far missed the mark on, which is taking advantage of that beautiful river. Um, I, I hope down the road that the north end of Salem can do that. But hats off to you guys, because that's just a spectacular move on your part. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's been a lot of planning and a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of ducks fell into, in the line in just the right way. <laughs> Great. Uh, Vincenzo, you have a question for Sean. Um, I was just wondering, uh, a wonderful presentation. I'm on the downtown advisory board and we're, um, you know, always trying to and discussing ways to make our downtown more vibrant and accessible. And, you know, it's a very difficult, um, part for us that, you know, we have a highway that basically goes through our downtown. So it's kind of a, how do we, how do we, you know, add these kinds of things uh, and make it more walkable, but know that we have ODOT that we're kind of fighting against all along the way. Question though, um, I, I was just wondering, is there, uh, does independence deal with the homeless issue the way that Salem um, is, it's kind of a forefront of a lot of our conversations? I would say so. So yes, we do have homeless pe people, you know, kind of living in our downtowns and, and along the river trail, um, not in great numbers, I would say. So I, I would say not quite, not not to the extent that Salem is. Um, and, you know, I think for, for us, at least it's it's at a, I won't call it a manageable level, but it's it's more kind of one of those, like, we kind of know all the, all the homeless folks that are there. And it's, um, I mean, and it, although it's frankly, it, it is a, it's a, it's a long-term concern because it's something that's, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's, I don't like calling it a problem because I mean, it's, it's a problem in many different ways. Um, you know, and, and by that, I mean, just homelessness too, generally as well. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to, we are trying to figure out how can we essentially create better support systems for this and, and help out the people who are here, um, and yes, kind of see if we see if we can get it managed before it kind of gets to a a, a you know a, a level that is that is essentially kind of getting out of control, basically. Great, thank you. Thank you, John McCulley. Have John McCulley, you have a question for Sean? Yeah, I'm um, I'm from Monmouth, where your poor second cousins here and uh, jealous. Um, but I'm just curious how these projects are, are financed. You do have some industry, I think some industrial property. Um, what, what do you use as far as taxes versus grants versus other forms of financing for all of these wonderful projects? Sure. So it's it's a it's a it's a wide range. Although for the for the big infrastructure ones, it largely was urban renewal funded. Um, we do have an urban renewal district that covers the downtown and most of our industrial area. Um, so, for example, the streetscape project was actually the very first urban renewal project the city did. Um, there's some urban renewal money in the amphitheater. Um, the movie theater was an urban renewal project. Um, we bought three, uh, you know, kind of rundown homes, burned two of them. And, and actually, if any of you are familiar with the Pink House Cafe, that used to be located on the uh, south end of where the, where the movie theater is now. And we sold that for $500 under the condition it'd be relocated. Um, and uh, and so, so that was an urban renewal project. 
um, you know, the, the Independence Landing, um, you know, the hotel and apartments and everything, that was also kind of the infrastructure and the, the, the property um, piece of it was also an urban renewal project, which is why it's sort of able to pay for itself because it's the property taxes coming off of the, the hotel and the apartments and this new mixed use building essentially are going to pay for the, uh, the infrastructure investment that was put into the property. Thank you. Larry Gray, you have a question for Sean. Thank you, President Sue. Uh, Sean, what an amazing uh, presentation. Uh, fantastic. And it's unbelievable what you guys have done. Um, wanted to know, uh, I, I think I heard that the Rogue Hop Farm might have closed or be closing. Um, what do you see as the impact there? And is there anything to replace it? Or what do you know? So I don't know, I don't know anything actually. <laughs> it's uh, I know I know Rogue is you know they have they have moved out. I think it was as of April first. Um, it is it is frankly a blow to uh, a lot of our kind of visitor oriented um, initiatives because bicycle tourism has been a big um, a big area for us and for the region. I know Rogue was a great both destination and sort of starting start and finish point uh, for a lot of folks. Um, and then, of course, being on the river, it, uh, you know, it was a great stopping point. You put into Buena Vista and you float for two or three hours and have, have lunch and a couple beers at Rogue and then you know, finish your float in Independence. That was just a, it was a perfect, um, perfect thing. So, I mean, in the short term, it's going to be, it's, an, it's unfortunate. Um, you know, we, we, frankly, Independence may get a little benefit in that, you know, people might start and finish their trips from Independence as opposed to Rogue. Um, I know... So Coleman Agriculture actually owns that whole area, that whole hop farm. Rogue was just leasing um, about 40 acres and the, ta and the, the you know, what they turned into the tap room. And I know um, over in Marion County, um, Crosby Hop Farm recently opened what they call Top Wire, which is a, they're another hop farm and they, it's essentially it's what Rogue had. Um, and I, I've noticed Coleman is doing a little more um, kind of branding around their name. And so I have hopes that they might um, see the opportunity and, and do something like that out there as well. Uh, but I will I say I have no inside knowledge, so I'm just completely speculating. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good answer. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Warren, you, Warren or Linda, you have a question for Sean? Linda's still, Linda, Linda still golfing. It's just me today. Okay. So being a, a past president of the Salem Downtown Association, being on the Downtown Development Advisory Board, i.e., in other words, I've been involved in a lot in, in the Salem Downtown area. Um, we found that there was a fair amount of opposition to things that we wanted to move forward. Did you find the same thing? Did you find the core group that simply just said, no, I want independence to say this, stay sleepy and in and, and the way it was. So I, I think the short answer is no, at least not in the sense of like a core, like a group of people. I mean, there's definitely some individuals out there um, that grumble about this and that um, as, as will happen with any project. Um, and I think Part of it is, you know, we really have put a lot, a lot, a lot of work into community engagement and these and these vision plans. And so um, it makes it easier when somebody says that's a terrible idea to say, well, did you participate in the vision 2020 process? You know, like we had all of these open houses, all of these surveys, all of these things. And, you know, the majority of people thought this was a great idea, you know? Um, and so that at least, I think it, it it's a, it's a it's a mechanism, um, you know, for our elected officials to be able to make dis, I think more definitive decisions because, um, you know, it's always hard for electeds, you know, and staff for that matter to sort of say no to to people, um, and so this it you know these vision plans are sort of offer a way to say look this is the will of the people, and you're never going to get a hundred percent of people on board, but this does indicate that it's you know you've got a serious majority of folks who think this is a good idea. Um, we do try to engage folks, talk to them, um, you know, kind of sort things out. I think, you know, there's, I, I saw there was a, a Facebook post a while ago about, about the Independence Landing Project uh, said that we, we screwed up a perfectly good gravel site, <laughs> a perfectly good gravel pit, you know? So, I mean, you know, you're never going to please everybody. Um, but we do, like I say, we really try to emphasize that this is not us coming up with bright ideas. This is us going out to the community and saying, you know, hey, what do we need to do to make independence 
what we want it to be. Um, and then we, you know, wherever the opportunity arises, we try to take those projects and move them forward. We uh, had tremendous opposition to the development of the Salem Convention Center, saying that it was going to take up the funds from the Urban Renewal District for 25 years. And in fact, it only took it took like 15 years to pay it off, and and it was a, it was in the in the black all the way along. Uh, it's just it's hard, at least in our community, sometimes to get. We don't have a, a third bridge, as an example, or as I call it, the fifth bridge. And, and so it's just been real difficult. I just was curious. And I, I think you're lucky. That's what I guess I want to say. You're lucky. I, I think I think you're right. Um, I also think we've, we, we have been able, I think, fortunately, to build up a substantial reservoir of, I think, goodwill, or at least, you know, we, we, we've got a lot of successful projects behind us. And Independence Landing was definitely that big reach that if we had tried it five years ago, um, I think it would it might have been a different a different story because we just you know it, there wasn't we didn't quite have all of those pieces together um, and so I think yeah there's you're right every situation is different um, and and yeah that, I mean this is why we ran that economic analysis because we wanted to show like look this thing <laughs> it, uh, it makes sense and uh, but yeah it's 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 always a struggle. Thank you. I think um, that was the last of the questions, Sean. And um, as we wrap up the meeting, one, I want to make sure that you have a moment to look look at all the thank you, thank you, thank yous that are in the chat. <laughs> um, you, yeah, it was just really inspiring. And um, I can't wait to get over there and, and really start to dig in and see, see all the changes. So um, Sean, in honor of you and your time with us today, we are going to make a donation to our very own Salem Rotary Foundation. So again, thank you for sharing with us and spending time with us today. We really appreciate it and all you're doing for independence. Um, so thank you. Um, and as we wrap up, um, next week, past District Governor Renee Campbell will be our program chair and it will be uh, presenters from the Portland Pearl Club on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So really looking forward to, to that program as well. So with that, uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Hopefully we see everybody out at the amphitheater on Friday from 12 to 1 before the donkeys start pouring cement. Um, and have a wonderful day, folks. Thanks for all you do. Bye-bye.